Okay, we are ready to go. I want to welcome everybody here to another Thursday Live with uh, Whitehorse Media and me, Steve Wahlberg. Today, today's going to be an exciting, uh, hopefully about an hour, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. We've got a big subject today, uh, which I'll introduce in just a second. And most of you know that we're now doing these live programs on Thursdays. Uh, we've been doing these for a couple of months and our audience is growing and we never know who's exactly going to be here. Uh, so far in the chat, different people have said uh, one person's in Nigeria, someone else in Sun Valley, California, Wenatchee, Washington, and Toronto, Canada. So we're getting a good mixture. Uh, before we get into the topic, I'd like to start out with a couple of verses from the Bible, going all the way back to the very beginning, to the book of Genesis. The very first verse in the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, and this is a fundamental biblical teaching that we didn't get here by chance. We didn't evolve. Uh, we didn't come from monkeys or some cosmic soup, but we have been uh, divinely created by God. And this world is God's creation. Uh, going down to Genesis chapter 7, it talks about the, the flood, which is a huge event in uh, biblical history. In Genesis 7, verse 11, it says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day where all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, and uh, I believe that there is a lot of evidence in the world around us that we can see that supports what I just read, that there was a global a global flood. So I'd like to bring in my guest uh, right now, and his name is Monty Fleming. Uh, Monty, welcome here. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, let me just introduce you a little bit. Uh, Monty is the son of uh, Elaine Fleming, who is a friend of mine. She's uh, She's got a lot of expertise in nutrition, and uh, I consult with her regularly, and she sent me your book, your book called Stories About Earth's History, A Geologist's Descent from Deep Time. She sent this to me as a gift. I didn't even have to pay for it. It was just came in the mail. And, and I get a lot of books. People send me this and that. And uh, this book just caught my attention. And so I began to, began to read it. And I was so uh, moved by it with the evidences that you bring out in this book supporting creation rather than evolution and looking at different uh, things in the world, the geologic columns, sedimentary layers, erosion, and uh, you just build a strong case that there is plenty of evidence around us uh, that, that there was a global flood. Uh, you have a PhD, I believe, in Earth Sciences. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, and, uh, and you've just been researching uh, these topics for a long time. So uh, here's your book and just uh, tell everybody, why did you write this book? What's kind of the story behind the story? Uh, so this may seem a little circuitous, but um, the Bible says that perfect love casts out fear. And uh, something that's really important in the Bible is faith. You know, you know, the whole faith chapter of Hebrews, it's got all these heroes of faith that accomplished all these great things by faith. And so it's important that we know that God is loving and that God can be trusted. Um, that is the antidote to fear. If you look at our society right now, I think the fear is driving a lot of people's decision making. It's not a good thing. Um, and the antidote to that is simply to know that God is good, that he loves us, that he can be trusted, that his promises are sure. And I know that one really large obstacle, a big hurdle that people have to accepting the Bible at face value is science. You know, scientists have gotten in the way. Um, and so I wrote this to, to show that there's not really... Uh, there's not a conflict between the Bible and science. You can actually use the Bible and you can, uh, we can see that the, the biblical history actually is compatible with the rock record. 
-hmm. Yeah, and as I, as I went through your book, and let me just tell everybody a little more about this book. Uh, this book is an easy book to read. It's not uh, overly technical and overly complicated, but it's very thorough, and uh, the research is definitely there. Uh, Monty has this whole section on erosion, uh, looking at coastal erosion and erosion of the continents, uh, of the mountains, and then uh, building a case that the, uh, the extent of erosion that's happening now, uh, if you just you know, project that uh, on top of the, the view that this world has been here for billions of years, that that just really doesn't, it doesn't fit. And he builds a strong case for that. He has a section on sediment depo uh, deposition, looking especially at the uh, geologic column and the different pancake like layers that are right upon each other uh, all around the world and what that teaches us. And then he goes into a section on fossils, the fossil record, uh, the fact that there are fossils at all and what that means. And before we're done, I want to ask you a little bit about the uh, incredible phenomena of some people finding uh, even organic matter still inside some of these fossils and what that means. And so anyway, this is a, this is a great faith building book. Uh, Monty has sent us a box of these books, and these are now available from Whitehorse Media. That's uh, a brand new product that we've just added to our store. You can get it on our on our website. Uh, stories about Earth's history. We're we're going to charge a little bit less than you can get on Amazon. Uh, only ten dollars, ten dollars a book. And so uh, I definitely recommend that you get this book to build your faith, to strengthen your conviction that science is compatible with the Bible, a uh, true science, and that the Bible definitely uh, is not just a book of myths, a book of stories, but it's real, uh, and the history is real. And especially we'll get into the flood uh, in a little while that it really did happen, and we'll talk about a lot of these things. And uh, during the last 20 minutes or so, we're shooting for an hour. I'd like to hear from you if you have questions for Monty. Uh, just send those in, uh, put them in the chat, and my as associate, my partner, Jeff Kyle, will put them on the screen and uh, give Ch uh, Monty a chance to answer those. So um, there's a lot of different ways that we can go with this, um, and I know that different people have many different questions about science and evolution and Darwin and, and uh, you know what the Bible really teaches. I guess one of the main things that impressed me as I read your book, had to do with um, your analysis of what's called the geologic column, which mm -hmm. is the, the sediment layers right on top of each other that we see. Uh, if people go to the Grand Canyon, you see one layer on top of another, and, and those layers appear all over the world. So uh, just talk to us about the significance of the geologic column. Uh, many evolutionists look at that column and say it supports evolution, but you believe differently. So talk to us about this and uh, enlighten us about what's really uh, staring at us in the face when we look at all these different layers around the world. So, um, I would say that the Western United States has three amazing parks where you can go and see these layers. Um, the first is Grand Canyon, like you mentioned. Um, and the Grand Canyon covers kind of the bottom part of the geologic column that you would see in a textbook. And so in the Grand Canyon, we would expect to find fossils of shells and fish and those kinds of things. And up at the very top of the Grand Canyon, we would expect to find fossils of um, amphibians, large salamander type creatures. Um, and the mainstream geological narrative is that these layers were laid down in different environments over millions of years. And so you have millions of years, one layer building up, and then typically there's a long break in time. And then another layer starts building up on top of that millions of years worth of material and then there may be another long break and then you get more layers um and the fossils are in there there's footprints in there um and it's well when you actually start looking closely at the details of the layers um 
the, I mean, the first thing that everybody notices is that it's just how flat they are over vast expanses. So the Grand Canyon is just a sliver in the bottom of a much bigger picture. Um, so if you back out from that sliver, you see that Zion National Park is part of that same erosional process. And if you go up higher in the column, you see that Bryce Canyon is part of the same process. And it's so all those layers, all the way from Grand Canyon up through Zion, up through Bryce, those are all just thousands of feet of layers of sediment, just one on top of the other with these beautiful flat contacts in between. Um, so it's interesting just thinking about how flat layers get deposited. Um, in modern environments, that happens underwater. I think that's a really important point. Um, we just don't get really beautiful flat layers deposited on the surface of the land ever. Um, you know, you were talking about your backyard and how, you know, in a million years, there's not going to be another beautiful flat layer on top of your backyard. It's, it's right. A different layer, a completely different kind of rock. And right. you won't see, you won't see uh, fossils in, in those right. layers because I mean, we have uh, sometimes, you know, we have a dead animal in our backyard, um, Mm -hmm. Our cat just brought in a just uh, yesterday. My my son said, uh, or my wife said, you got to go in Seth's room. He's 17 years old, and there was a <laughs> dead squirrel in there because uh, the cat had uh, one of our yeah. cat's prints had had killed a squirrel, brought it through the cat door, and deposited it on Seth's floor in his bedroom. And so I'm, the, you know, <laughs> as the dad of the house, you know, it was my lot yeah, to me yeah. to uh, pick up the dead squirrel or you know get it out of there, and I threw it in the forest. Now, you know, it's within a few months, if I go back to where I threw that dead squirrel in the forest, there's not going to be a fossil no. of that no, squirrel. Can't. Things that die just decay and disintegrate. Yeah. And yet what we see in the fossil record is not what I'm ever going to see in my backyard. You see one layer on top of another, supposedly representing millions of years in natural processes. And you see uh, fossils preserved, buried inside of them. And you build a case in your book that this is this just doesn't happen without some kind of right. catastrophic water activity. Right. Right. So so there's that. There's the there's the fossils. That's an interesting point. The other thing is those flat just have the flatness of those contacts between those layers. Um, so I did an experiment in my backyard years ago where I layered some colored sand. Um, and it only took four days for earthworms to completely, earthworms and ants to completely churn up those four layers. Um, and some places on like coastal seafloor, uh, it'll, it'll get churned up in a matter of hours. Um, this is normal in modern environments, but at these contacts, you supposedly have this layer, you know, sitting out open in millions of years and there's no tree roots, there's no plants, there's no worms burrowing, there's no ants, there's nothing disturbing that surface for millions of years. Um, and so that's that's a head scratcher, you know, if, if the million years are real. Yeah, so, so what do you say could realistically have caused that? So what you need is one layer deposited on top of another catastrophically, very quickly, one after another. Um, and the, we can see that. And then like, there's something else that's cool that I didn't cover in the book is that very often you'll see what we call soft sediment deformation. So you get one layer, it's soft. You get another layer, it comes in on top, and it actually, you can see that it pushes down into the previous layer sometimes. Um, call them load casts. And then when the, it turns to rock and you pry it apart, you see this, these casts, you know, of, of the in between them. Um, or you can see it in the cliff face. Um, in, there's a picture in the book, and I don't tell you, I, in the book, I, I'm just talking about the contact, but, but one of those pictures in the book uh, there's what's called an injectite. So the, there was, there's red shale and kind of a tan sandstone. And that sandstone actually got liquefied and shot down into the shale. And there's supposed to be 6 million years in that, in that contact. 
and yet the red shell was soft enough so that that sandstone could get liquefied and shot down into it six million years later. Yeah. You know, six, you know, six million years. It's much yeah, easier yeah. if that time just doesn't exist. Right, quote unquote. And uh, yeah. and from from what what I've read in your book and and the research that I've done, uh, what can what is the most reasonable rational uh, uh, re way of accounting for these different kinds of layers, different kinds of sediment that are different colors, even. Uh, would be yeah. through catastrophic sifting of yeah. sediment yeah. because of water, water right. activity, sifting the rocks and then layering. And then also the, the, the reason why there's fossils in some of these layers at all is because they were buried rapidly. Because, you know, if a deer dies right. in my backyard or a squirrel or any other creature, it's just going to decompose. But the fact that we have that fossils even exist in these layers gives a, a strong indication that they were buried rapidly. And I just want to go back to the text that I read in Genesis chapter 7, verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the uh, 17th day of the month, that same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up. And the windows of heaven were open and the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. And you build the case in your book that what we see with our eyes uh, in the Grand Canyon and all these different layers around the world and the fact that there are fossils in them at all, uh, this fits perfectly with the biblical description of what happened in the Great Flood. Isn't that right? Yeah, um, something interesting about fossilization. So when I was a kid, I, I found a, some, I don't know, dead rat or something. And I thought, oh, I'm going to make a fossil. And so I went and buried it. Um, and then I tried to dig it up a few days later. And it was it had been eaten under the ground. Um, I hadn't buried it deep enough. But there was also another problem, which is that you actually need that mineralized water from the fountains of the deep. You need the mineral in the water. Um, so that mineral actually goes into the, like it actually gets deposited in the cells. And it, in some cases, it, it does an amazing job of um, preserving the cell structures so that we can actually take those organisms that have been fossilized and we can see the internal organs. We can see, um, uh, we, you know, it's, it's still there in 3D. Um, and you and can't do that without. Speaks and this yeah. speaks volumes to us, doesn't it? That that these creatures were buried rapidly, extremely rapidly. Um, yeah. I, I've read articles in secular scientific literature that say that some of these were fossilized within hours, or the fossilization process began within hours of death. <laughs> now, you know, another thing that really intrigued me about uh, inside your book. And let me just again mention to those who are just joining, I'm with Monty Fleming. He's the author of a book, uh, Stories About Earth's History, a geologist's descent from deep time, meaning when he looks at what's in the world and what's in the fossil record, uh, he utters a protest that all of this is a reflection of millions of years of history, even billions of years uh, he's a short chronologist. He believes in the Bible. He believes the evidence is in the rocks that supports the biblical uh, the biblical view. And uh, White Horse Media now has this book available for ten dollars. It's on our website. Uh, we've got a shipment of these coming in, and I highly recommend this book to help you to build your faith that what the Bible says is perfectly reflected in uh, in what's around us. You know, and it just has really. It just impresses me so much to think that uh, I believe, I already believe that there is a God, that he made the world in six days, he rested on the seventh day, and that uh, in the days of Noah, the world was wicked, and he sent a flood to cleanse the earth from its wickedness. And what we see when we go to the Grand Canyon and many other places around the world, you can see uh, abundant evidence that that is exactly what happened not too long ago. So, Monty, uh, why do you think that there are so many evolutionists in this world who look at this evidence, but, you know, they're wearing glasses, like, you know, yeah, they put on right. their glasses and they look at the geologic column and they see evolution. 
whereas we put on our glasses and we see the flood. You know, uh, why is it that so many evolutionists are not able to see what is actually right in front of them? I think perhaps a useful analogy is the question, why did the Jews during the time of Christ, why did the nation of Israel, um, you know, Jesus's peers, why did they believe that he was going to ascend to the throne of David and drive out the Romans? Um, and I think the obvious answer is that that's what they wanted. They wanted, uh, they needed that to happen. That was, they felt like they needed that. Um, and so when they looked through the scripture, they pulled out the data that supported what they wanted. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of them, you know, a lot of them didn't do it maliciously. They didn't do it, um, you know, they weren't trying to be deviant. They were, you know, a lot of them just went, went with the flow. And I think a lot of evolutionists just go with the flow too, in the same way. Um, but also, you know, the data really is there if you want to look at it. Uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, evolution, uh, a couple of things. One is that I think God has, Christ you know, Christianity's given God a bad name throughout history. You know, the, you know, taking, you know, the Inquisition and then on down till now, uh, you know, there are, there are, uh, things that we all wish wouldn't happen in the name of Christianity um, right. that do happen. Um, and so evolution is an easy way to say, oh, it's all just, you know, a bunch of myths. We don't have to worry about it. Um, so that's part of it. And then people have the personal reasons. I think every choice that we each make, mm, like, we build our worldview through the choices that we make day by day, I think. Yeah, and it's unfortunate that many have thrown out the baby with the bathwater, as yeah. they, the proverb says, because of many things that Christians or professed Christians have done in the past, have given uh, God and the church and Jesus a bad name, so people just dismiss the whole thing. And then if you yeah. dismiss the Bible completely, then what's left is uh, uh, evolution and the idea that we all just came here as a result of mindless right. forces that have no planning, no coordination, no purpose. And, you know, we're here and we're gone and, and that's it. But the Bible gives us uh, a much different picture that we've been created by God and we're here for a reason. And, and the Bible is true. And God wiped out the world in the time of Noah because of its wickedness. And he's going to do the same thing again, mm -hmm. but he wants to rescue people out of this world who, uh, come to their senses and realize that he's good, that he's our maker, that he loves us. He gave his son to pay the price for us. And he has any, he has an eternal plan for our lives. Now, uh, one of the things that really interested me in your book had to do with the, the whole idea of uh, researchers or geologists uh, mm -hmm. discovering some fossils that have something inside them. That's quite, quite uh, amazing. Tell us about that. Yeah, um, there have been some really uh, shocking finds, um, and they're not new. They, they've been they go back many decades, but I, th I would say that in the last two decades, they've gotten a lot more traction, a lot more visibility, and uh, probably the most wide widely known is um, soft tissue in Tyrannosaurus rex bones. Um, so this animal is supposed to have died over 60 million years ago. And yet when some students were looking at, at the bone under a microscope, you know, they're seeing blood vessels and like, no, that can't be. And so they dissolve and, and then, you know, so you dissolve, you dissolve away the bone in acid and you're left with actual protein tyrannosaurus protein um from the original animal <laughs> and they they tested it in a lot of interesting ways one of the ways that they tested it was with antibodies so antibodies work by sticking to something that they are 
designed to stick to. So you catch a cold virus, your body makes antibodies to that virus. And now when you, when that same cold virus attacks you again, the, the antibodies will recognize it and stick to it. Um, so they, they tested these, these, this Tyrannosaurus tissue with antibodies and like elastin and collagen antibodies, call it, you know, like they're just these proteins, um, would stick to the, would stick to these tissues. Um, so that's a really good indicator that this is actually real dinosaur protein that we're finding in the bones. Um, and more recently, people have noticed because, and the thing is, people didn't notice this before because nobody thought to check. Um, you know, why would you check for protein in something that's tens of millions of years old? Is, you, know, you wouldn't ever expect it to be there. Um, but now that people started finding it, more people have started checking and you can dissolve just a piece of scrap bone and find protein in it. Um, so that's just fascinating. So, and, and what does that, what does that mean? What's the lesson well, from that reality? So these proteins, they break down over time. Um, we know this cause we, it happens to our food if we leave it out overnight or even, you know, depending on what it is, some of it lasts a few hours, some might last a few days, but but our you know the our food degrades over time and uh so so some of the really interesting protein they've actually found like termite dna from over 30 million years ago for example you know 30 million years but the dna is still intact and they were actually able to sequence the dna um and they were able to discern that this termite is not a modern species you know they could tell which modern species it was related to um and so DNA actually falls apart pretty quickly. Um, you mentioned, well, so uh, there was a guy who, it's interesting. So there's, there's researchers that find these things and then there's researchers that are sure that they don't exist because of the time problem. And so one of these researchers that is sure that these things don't exist, he did a really thorough study on DNA um, from extinct birds in Madagascar, I believe it was. And so he came up, he came out to the conclusion that DNA's half-life the, in the, nu the nucleus of the cell, it's about 250 years. So in about 250 years, you expect about half of the DNA to fall apart, half of the bonds in the DNA to fall apart. In another 250 years, you expect another half and so on and so forth. Um, so that means that in a few thousand years, you would expect nothing. You'd expect nothing. You'd expect no bonds to be left. Um, and yet after what was supposed to be 38, you know, 30, 30 something million years, they, they, they were able to sequence this um, termite DNA. They were also able to sequence some uh, horse DNA from, you know, that was supposed to be seven or so hundred thousand years, you know, but again, you know, the DNA falls apart so quickly, those bonds in the DNA, they're not very strong. Um, and they fall apart. They, they fall apart so quickly that uh, you would expect nothing left after just a few thousand years. So I guess the point is that when they find these di dinosaur bones with organic matter mm -hmm. uh, inside dinosaur bones that are supposed to be millions of years old, uh, that's really impossible. So it it's is. More, it's a short. It's a much shorter chron chronology than a yeah. deep time, long chronology, yeah. which supports again the. Uh, you know, the biblical narrative, the Bible, if you if you look at the biblical chronology, we've been on this earth uh, since the creation of the world for approximately 6,000 years. And from Adam and Eve to the flood, we're looking at, I think, about 1,600 years. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, something yeah. like that. So 1,600 years and then coming down to today, we're looking at, um, you know, approximately another 4,400 years. Yeah that we've since the time of the flood. So it's been, you know, 4,000 or so years. So it's, it hasn't been millions of years. And the evidence that's in the bones uh, suggests that the, that those dinosaurs or whatever they were, were most likely buried uh, mm -hmm. rapidly in the flood. And that that's the reason why we can account for small yeah. amounts of organic matter that are still inside those yes. bones. Whereas if they, if this would have happened millions of years ago, 
we wouldn't find them. And I'm pretty right. sure in your book you mentioned that some of the some of the people that have discovered these this organic matter, they share this with some of the evolutionary scientists, and the scientists say, no, this it, that that can't be. It just can't be there. Uh, you know, it's just not possible. But it's the reason yeah. why they think it's not possible is because it doesn't fit with their evolutionary right. framework. Is that correct? Right. So, yeah. So I would say, um, you know, this, you know, from my perspective, it's not even, it's not surprising that we would find like collagen in fossils. I would, you know, I would kind of expect to find collagen in fossils um, just because I don't believe they're millions of years old. Um, so, yeah. 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 Yeah, I, I I don't believe that either. I believe uh, in the Bible now. Now, yeah. w one question you mentioned that a lot of uh, th that a lot of people ask is why is it that even many Christians today uh, who claim to believe in the Bible still also accept evolutionary theory? You know, how can how yeah. can that be? Isn't that sort of a uh, oxymoron? How can that? How do you explain that? Right. Um, well, so I was sitting in a class in the morning at church many years ago, and the man lecturing was a renowned researcher, physician, and he had given a whole series of lectures on he given a whole series of lectures on why we should accept these millions of years. He was trying to convince a bunch of people at the church that that millions of years was true that this was correct that we just needed to accept it and someone at the end of his lecture someone said do you realize what you're giving up and he kind of stopped for a minute and then he said yes but if we don't accept millions of years if we don't accept deep time you know these millions and billions of years we won't have a seat at the table of scientific discussion. Hmm. Um, and the verse that came to my mind was, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not the friendship with the world is enmity with God. Um, you know, he was willing to give up everything that Christianity is based on, everything that it stands for, or at least the foundation, um, the foundation of it. I mean, you know, he wanted to keep some of the, he wanted to keep a lot of the trappings, but he wanted, he was willing to give up the foundation so that we could be on the same page as the rest right. of the world. Right. And like you said, have a seat at the table. Yeah. You know, that that's interesting. And uh, this whole program that we're doing and, and with you here as my guest, uh, we've decided to call this, I've decided to call it uh, Willingly Ignorant. And it's based upon a Bible verse that I think is very relevant for, our, for everybody, to, everybody to look at. It's in 2 Peter chapter 3. Uh, in verse 3, it's, uh, Peter wrote, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, you know, or skeptics, people that, that mock and who don't believe in the Bible. And then in verse, uh, and then in verse 4, it talks about the beginning of creation, uh, that they really, you know, they... They've drifted away from God and his word, these scoffers. And then in verse 5, it says, uh, For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Mm -hmm. And we see that in the fossil record. We see that yeah. the very fact that there are fossils. We see it in the geologic column. We see it in the layers that have been sifted by water action that are right on top of each other. We see it from the organic matter that we some people are finding inside dinosaur bones. But they are willingly ignorant because they just don't want to see. Uh, and like you said, maybe it's because they they want the place at the table. They want yeah. respect. And they think that it's just... Uh, it's beneath them to believe in yeah. the Bible. And it's also interesting in, in the next verse, it says, but the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved for fire against the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. Mm -hmm. So it goes back to the beginning of the world. It goes back to the flood. 
and it says this is an example of what's going to happen in the future and that people are um, you know willingly blind blinded to to these facts and i think a lot of people haven't really thought through why it's important also so you know the, the you know famous pastors or uh, you know, other important leaders in the community, in our Christian communities, will head down the path of, you know, following after the world, going, you know, believing in evolution. And other people will just follow because, you know, these guys must know what they're talking about, I think. And, you know, yeah. and also it's, you know, it's fashionable. It's, it's, it's not embarrassing. Right. And, and you mentioned you, the person asked the question, do you realize what you're giving up? Could you just kind of summarize uh, in, in a nutshell, you know, what are people really giving up if they choose the, the place at the table and what I would consider to be really pseudoscience right. uh, in order to, you know, get along with the uh, quote unquote scientific community? Uh, yeah. What are they giving up by going in that direction? Well, I think, um, so perhaps it, it's useful to think about, uh, you know, we asked the question earlier, why do people believe evolution? And I think the reason, like from Satan's perspective, um, you know, he had tried for centuries to burn the Bible, to literally burn it. Um, and when it came to, uh, you know, but a few hundred years ago, it just exploded. Everybody could get one. And so what's he going to do now? Um, well, he, I think evolution is a major step. It's a major necessary tool that he has to destroy the authority of the Bible without actually having to burn it physically. Um, so you, you really give up biblical authority when you give up the creation story. Um, you know, it, it's back in Genesis and some people will say, oh, well, just the first 11 chapters of Genesis for allegory and all the rest is real. Um, but like you just read, you know, you're reading from New Testament and he's referring back to the flood and he's telling you, this is important. This is talking about God's judgment and it's going to happen again. Um, and I, you know, pulling back, uh, back to what I said about, you know, having faith that God is actually trustworthy. Um, I, it's, it's important you know, one of our, you know, our, our hope is in the resurrection, in that God is going to restore the earth and uh, God is going to recreate it. Um, and if we don't believe that God has the power to recreate the earth or to create the earth in the first place, why are we going to trust in him to do it again next time? Um, you know, I don't know that. Like, why would we give up one of those but not the other? I'm not sure. Right. Yeah. Um, somebody once said, if you if you uh, aim for nothing, you'll hit it. <laughs> yeah. And, and if yeah. people believe that there is no God, if they believe that the Bible's not true, what do they have left? They have nothing. Yeah. They have nothing other than this small life, this short life, and, and uh, you know, what they have, and then that's it. But the Bible gives us an eternal perspective that we were made by God, that he loves us, that he has a plan for us. He wants us to live forever. That's why he gave his own son. Mm -hmm. And so if we give up the Bible for evolution, we're, we're giving up everything, uh, everything yeah. that, that is really meaningful. Uh, let me mention again to everybody, and then I want to take your questions, that um, I'm interviewing uh, Monty Fleming, who is uh, the author of a very, very uh, good book. I've read it. I loved it. Uh, I, I wanted to have him as my guest. I called him and he said, sure, I'd be happy to come on. This book is called Stories About Earth's History, A Geologist Descents from Deep Time. And he builds a case in a very reasonable, systematic, intelligent uh, way that what we see around us, the evidence of erosion, the evidence in the continents, the evidence from the geologic column, the evidence from uh, the Grand Canyon and from the existence of fossils, that all of this uh, strongly supports the biblical view that uh, God made the world and then he also destroyed it because of its wickedness. 
uh, by a global flood. So Whitehorse Media is now making this a book, book available for only $10. Uh, it's in our store. Uh, I recommend it strongly. We've got a, a, a case of these while supplies last. Uh, we'd love to, to send you one of those. So, uh, Monty, in the time that we have left, um, I want to take some questions. And maybe Jeff, uh, my partner on the other side of this screen, if you could just put up some of those questions. Uh, I saw one that came in. Uh, and, Monty, you've asked one of the questions you said people often ask you has to do about the dinosaurs. So here's yeah. our first question, though. Maybe we'll get to that one. Uh, how much? How many years after creation was the flood? So question number one from Evelyn. Yeah, I think, yeah, you, you answered that one. It was uh, six, about 1,600 years. Right, based on um, biblical chronology, based on, based on chronology, the record right. that we have in the book of Genesis. So, yes, uh, Evelyn, maybe you missed when I when I made that comment. But, uh, yes, somewhere around creation, 1,600 years, the flood. And then after 4,000 years from creation, that's when Jesus came. And it's been about 2,000 years since he was here. So it's been about 6,000 years, give or take a few years, yeah. uh, from the creation of the world. So, okay, another question here is, uh, okay, creation is about 6,000 years. So where does the millions of years come from? Before creation, the earth was without form or void. Were there things on the earth despite the fact that it was without form? So how would you answer yeah, that question? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the... I think the traditional Adventist view has been there's the, you know, the, we don't like, you know, we'll, we'll talk about, um, there's a, there might've been time before day one where nothing was on earth at all. Um, a lot of Christian denominations will say, um, there's, uh, you know, the entire universe was created day one of creation. Um, and those are interesting scientific questions. Um, I, I would say that what's theologically important is, is there, it was, you know, was there life before day one of creation? Um, it says in the beginning, God created heavens and the earth and the earth was that form and void and, and darkness on the face of the deep. And, you know, and God said, let there be light. That was day one. Um, so if you look really carefully at that text, I think you can either say that the earth was without form and void for a while, or that was day one. I, I'm not going to take right. a, a dogmatic stance either way. Um, and, and I would say that, that it is an interesting scientific question. Um, but uh, it, yeah, it's, uh, the important point is, I would say theologically, is that sin create caused death. Um, you know, we want, and and that's the point that I'm making in the book, which is that, uh, you know, we can see that the the life, the record of life in the rocks, can be it's compatible with with a six thousand year creation, um, whether you believe that there was a body of the earth here previous to that or not with no life on it. Um, now, some people will, some people will take that, that, you know, that long gap theory where there's just nothing here, like the body of the earth is here, but there's nothing on it. Um, and they'll try to match that with, you know, they'll try to say that's where all the, that's where these millions of years fit in. Um, but that doesn't work because uh, for example, I was studying, fossil quails in the Pisco formation in Peru, and we'll have a, a volcanic ash layer and we send it off to the laboratory, it'll be like two volcanic ash layers and a whale in the middle, right? So the bottom one, say it's 12 million years old, the, you know, the top one, let's say it's 9 million years old and there's a whale. So the lab will tell us that that whale is between nine and 12 million years old. Um, so you can see how there's life in between, uh, you know, there, there's life down there in those, you know, millions of years where, where it's, you know, where we don't actually believe that it's millions of years old. Um, so these dates that the scientists are getting back, they come, you know, they come from these, these studies of the rocks where they look at, at radioactive material in the rocks. 
Um, and that radioactive material is in with the fossils, you know, in these volcanic ash layers, in the, bas in the volcanic flows, you know, basalt flows and other things. Um, so it's an interesting scientific question, but it's not like, I don't know that we have a good answer to that specific thing. Like yeah, those, it, those it's, 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 it seems to me that many people are trying to center to create a synthesis between yeah. evolution and the Bible. And personally, um, where I land on one side or the other is I favor the view that uh, there was nothing here until mm -hmm. God made the heavens and the earth on the first day and the second day that he wasn't predependent upon uh, any yeah. kind of physical matter. And uh, the Bible certainly doesn't offer us a different view. So, uh, and as he said, you know, the main thing is that we believe the Bible. And the Bible is very clear that God made the world in six days and he rested on the seventh. Yeah. And that we've been here, uh, humanity has been here for uh, only a few thousand years, not billions of years or millions of years. And so, you know, we need to have our faith in scripture so that we don't, end up on the side of the skeptics and the scoffers that yeah. second Peter talked about who are willingly uh, ignorant. So let's see, do we have another question, Jeff? Um, any more coming up? Yes, okay. It says, uh, this yeah. is from John Goodwill. Please explain the size of fossils compared to today's fossils. Good question. That's Thanks. a good question. That's a fun question. So um, the there are centipedes in the fossil record that are over six feet long. Wow. Yeah. And they're wide. They're just really big animals. Um, there are dragonflies with like a three foot wingspan. Um, really? And then of course there's the flying creatures, the, uh, you know, the pterodactyls and the, and some really large birds. Um, and so there have been some interesting scientific hypotheses put out there for why these things might have been so big. And one of them is, well, maybe during the time they lived, there was more oxygen in the air. Um, and there's two ways to get more oxygen. One is to increase pressure. Like, so if you, if you strap on a scuba tank and dive down into the ocean, you'll actually have more oxygen available to you. Um, just because of that extra pressure, um, or you can increase the concentration. Um, now, if you increase the pressure, that would actually help the, bird, the really big birds fly. Um, so that's an interesting possibility. It's an interesting hypothesis. Um, uh, the other thing is that if God created everything just perfect, I think we would expect everything to be a little bigger too. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense in that we're rather than us evolving, we're devolving. Uh, yeah. We're getting smaller. Right. We're getting, you know, uh, less intelligent. Uh, everything, the, the animals, the trees aren't as big. The animals aren't as big. The dragonflies aren't as big. Yeah. The centipedes yeah. aren't as big. You know, can you imagine yeah. uh, a huge six foot centipede running around your backyard? My kids would freak out. Yes. Uh, and, you know, and that just, you know, the, the evidence again that we're declining rather than uh, getting bigger, you know, that fits yeah. the biblical view as well. So it just seems to me, and, and your book deals with many different lines of evidence. That's what I really liked about reading your book is that it just, uh, it dealt with many lines of evidence all pointing in the same direction, that the Bible is true, that the earth is young, that we've been here for thousands of years. The evidence for that is all around us. Uh, it's willing ignorance where people just refuse to yeah. see what's there. It's, it's, to me, it's a little bit like the resurrection of Lazarus. You know, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And, and that was the crowning act of who he, of the evidence that he was the son of God. And the religious leaders, you know, they, they refused to um, yield to that evidence. And that, that was what led them to finally plot the final plot to put him to death. So, uh, you know, there's an old saying that says none are so blind that but those who will not see. Uh, another interesting quote that I read recently, uh, in my family, we have these little you know, quotes for the day on our counter, and this is one of them I read. It says, the man who thinks that God is too kind 
to punish actions vile is bad at heart of unsound mind or very juvenile. Uh, that's from an old book of uh, poems compiled by J. Gordon Kugler. And, you know, that really impressed me that, you know, some people think, well, they, they don't think there is a God. And then if they, even if they do, they think, well, he's too good to punish sin. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, the evidence of the, of the Grand Canyon and the fossil record yeah. and the fact that, you know, we can see things used to be bigger and now they're smaller. You know, all of this supports the, uh, the biblical flood, the biblical narrative, and that, um, you know, there's, there's only so much that God can be patient with. And if the world gets, yeah. to, when the world crosses a line of wickedness, God intervenes. And that's what yeah. he did in the days of Noah. And, and Jesus said, as it was in Noah's day, it would be the same before he comes. And I mean, we can see all around us right now with the reports in the news, the papers, the riots, the, uh, you know, the heartless murders that we're rapidly getting to the point where uh, God is finally going to say enough is enough. It's time to yeah. you know, cleanse the earth. In Revelation, it talks about God's judgment. It says, you know, fear God for the hour of his judgment has come. And then it says, and worship him who made the sea and the springs of waters. And I think the reason it says springs of waters right there is because it's referring back to the fountains of the great deep from the other text that you read in Genesis. Right. The fountains of the great deep broke up, and that's where the flood came from. That's where that was the source of God's judgment. And so the angel in Revelation says, Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him because he created those springs of waters. Judgment is coming again. That's right. I've I've been impressed with the same thing. And let me read that verse. This is what we call the first angel's message in Revelation 14, 6 and 7. I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel or the good news to preach to them that dwell upon the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue and people. So here's the good news showing that God is a God who saves through the gospel. But then it says, he says with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. God is also a judge. And then it says, worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters, as you mentioned, which takes us back to Genesis, where the fountains mm -hmm. were uh, broken up and the flood took place. So that shows that God is, uh, he's our creator. He's, he's a God who makes, he's a God who saves, he's a God who judges, and he's also a God who finally does punish uh, when people reject his love and his mercy. So all of that is in the first angel's message, and it's, mm -hmm. It's extremely relevant for us today. So, Jeff, any more questions for Monty? Uh, okay, here's another one. I wonder how evolutionists explain our week, which came from creation, a seven-day weekly cycle. Any thoughts on that? That's a good question. I, you know, I've never heard anybody come up with a good explanation for that. Um, I, I've heard some people try, but I've yeah. I, I've never heard a good ex I've never heard a good ex evolutionist explanation for the week. Yeah, I don't think there is, and yet the week goes back to all the way back to Genesis. Yeah. And you know, I've I've read that you can you know we calculate uh, the day and the month and the year based on revolutions dealing with the the Earth and the Sun. But how do we get the week? You know, there's nothing right. in the planets that. Yeah. Uh, that gives birth to a seven day weekly cycle. And maybe this is a good time for me to mention that uh, Whitehorse Media also has another book called The Truth About the Sabbath, which goes back to creation, which ties in with our topic that God made the world in six days. He rested on the seventh day. The seventh day weekly cycle is built in the, to the fabric of, uh, of humanity and to history. Uh, this book is available from Whitehorse Media. It's not a big book. It's loaded with information on this topic. It's normally $3 a book. But we have a special a discount right now. We're making it available for only a dollar. Uh, if you go on to our store, uh, and if you look at the look for the truth about the Sabbath, you'll see there's a discount code Sabbath book. And if you type in the discount code, you get the discount uh, for one dollar a book. So uh, that book's available. Plus uh, Monty's book, Stories About Earth's History, a great faith building uh, faith building book. Uh, Jeff, any more questions as we get ready to wind this up? Any more that Monty can can answer in a little bit of time we've got left? Okay, here's another one uh, from Larry. So if the dinosaurs were thousands of years old, not millions, did they exist with humans? It would, seem, it would seem that the answer would be yes. 
Um, uh, now, there, there is one caveat I would add, which is that we don't find human fossils with dinosaur fossils. So it would appear that they didn't really live in the same areas, perhaps. Um, but they would have been on the Earth at the same time. And they would have been destroyed in the flood? Would they, they would have been destroyed, destroyed in the flood, yeah. So dinosaurs would have been part of the original creation. Um, so one important point, I think I know that, uh, like I've heard a lot of people have trouble with that idea, um, but something to remember is that dinosaurs, most dinosaurs ate plants. You know, they weren't, they weren't hostile originally. No, none of God's creation was hostile originally. It was all beautiful at first. And these most dinosaurs so they ate plants they moved together in herd probably probably large herds like the bison in north america um and you know so they wouldn't have they would it just would have been another animal on the earth and most it, uh, something else to remember is that most of the species like the, the species that we have left are just a small number compared to what was originally created um you know, all the different kinds of animals and plants that were created. There was a lot more diversity before the flood. And so, um, you know, maybe they were, uh, um, they were, you know, originally made by God, but after sin, they, yeah. they changed just like saber tooth tigers, you know, have these right. big yeah. gigantic uh, fangs, but I don't think God originally made them to look like that. Right. And or, there might have been there space. might have also been some tampering, you know, with nature right. going on. Right. The pre-flood people were very intelligent, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, genetic things going on these days where there's splicing yeah. and this right. and that, and we don't really know what they did. But whatever they did, it was they became so bad that God said enough is enough, and He mm -hmm. destroyed them. But I think we'll get answers to those questions uh, someday when when. Jesus comes, he'll explain this to us. Okay, here's, uh, let's take one more question. Did God put the dinosaurs on the earth for man's good, like fossil fuels, uh, et cetera? What do you think about that? Um, so most of our, uh, most of our fossil fuels don't come from dinosaurs. Uh, they, they're perhaps a very small amount. Most of the fossil fuels actually come from like algae or, uh, you know, something, or, you know, or plants, all the plants that got buried and turned into coal. Trees. Trees, yeah. Um, so there's that. The other thing is that, you know, I think that God did put dinosaurs on the earth for man's good, uh, you know, for our pleasure and enjoyment. You know, I think they were beautiful creatures when he created them. And they, and I think that they played an important role in the ecosystem. Okay. That sounds good. Well, um, I appreciate very much, Monty, you're taking time to spend with us and hopefully everybody that's been watching has been richly uh, blessed by this conversation. And uh, once again, Monty's book, Stories About Earth's History is avail available from Whitehorse Media. I had him, I wanted him as my guest because I read the book. I really liked it. Uh, I was blessed by it. It strengthened my faith. This is a faith building book. It's available from Whitehorse Media for anybody that would like to get one. And let me close with back to Second Peter, just to re-emphasize what the prediction is in the Bible about skepticism in the last days and about the flood and about what is coming uh, in the days in the days ahead. Second Peter chapter three says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers or skeptics walking after their own lusts and saying, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Verse five says, for this they willingly are ignorant, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was in the days of Noah, uh, that world being overflowed with water perished. And we see the evidence of that uh, all around the world in the geologic column, in the layers of sediment, and in the fact that fossils were buried rapidly and have been preserved for people to find today. And then it tells us that uh, the heavens and the earth 
which are now what we are walking on and looking up and seeing in the sky by the same word they are kept in store reserved to fire against the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men so these are powerful scriptures and they you know they speak to us very clearly that uh, there's another big catastrophe coming uh, when Jesus comes and it's going to be this instead of water it's going to be fire and God is going to get rid of sin once and for all and he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth and it's going to be full of love and happiness and goodness for those who want to be there yeah, and right. I certainly want to be there so thank you again Monty for taking yeah. uh, time yeah. say hello to your mother yeah. uh, good friend of mine uh, Dr. Elaine Fleming and let me have a prayer with, uh, with everybody so we, as we uh, wrap this up. Uh, dear God in heaven, thank you for this time that we could spend together. Uh, we pray for your blessing and for your Holy Spirit. Be with Monty and his family. Uh, be with uh, me and my family. Be with everybody that's been watching this, this uh, dialogue and discussion. And may we all realize that your word is true, that the evidence uh, for its truthfulness is right in front of our eyes. It's around us, all around us. And help us uh, not to be willingly ignorant, but to be uh, believing, to believe in your book and to believe in Jesus. Uh, bless us all, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, thank you everybody for being part of this. And uh, until our next uh, Thursday live with White Horse Media and Steve Wahlberg, uh, we'll sign off. So. God bless you and uh, keep looking up. Thank you. You're welcome, Monty. Thank you.